Alhamdulillah, today we continue with ayah number 12 of Surah al Hujurat. We had discussed in terms of mutual dealings three sicknesses in the previous discussion. The first was mocking at one another, the second was to find fault and deride one another, and the third was to call one another names. Today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu jtanibu kathiran min al O you who believe, abstain from many forms of suspicion. Abstain from many of the suspicions. Inna ba'd al-dhanni ith. Verily, some suspicions are sin. So this word zon is relating to an assumption on probable evidence. That's the technical definition. Assumption on probable evidence. So what the Quran is referring to here is that you should not suspect somebody of doing something evil. You should rather investigate and if there is sound evidence, then of course your suspicion will prove true. But if you just have cursory evidence, then that should not be sufficient to suspect somebody of something evil. Now when it comes to suspicion, not all suspicion is incorrect. There are conditions or certain situations. For example, Imam Abu Bakr al-Jassas in his Ahkam al-Quran, he mentions that you have zon, suspicion, that will come in different categories. That zon that is totally prohibited. Then that zon that is imperative, it's necessary. Then that zon that is recommended. And then that one that is permissible. So the one that is totally impermissible is that you should never have any suspicion in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن الظن بالله That none of you should die without having favorable thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must always have positive thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, أنا عند ظني عبدي بي I am as my servants think of me. So we should never have any evil thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way, we should not have any evil thoughts without any rational grounds against any Muslim, where the outer condition shows that that person is good and noble. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, Iyakum wadhan, avoid suspicion, because suspicion is the worst of all evil talks. Avoid suspicion because suspicion is the worst of all evil talks. So a person, a person should, should not, based on outer evidence, if a person, a fellow Muslim, seems to be upright, they seem to be a good person, and perhaps somebody says something about that person, then we should never entertain any suspicion about that person, unless, of course, there is factual evidence that is there. So this is the situation wherein a person should not have any suspicion for somebody. So if there is a matter, for example, where a decision needs to be taken, and there is no clear-cut proof based on the Quran and the Sunnah, and this case has been brought forward to somebody, for example, in an Islamic court, a judge is sitting there, there's no clear ruling from the Quran and Sunnah with regards to a specific situation. So now he has to assess the evidence. Perhaps there may be some witnesses on one side, witnesses on the other side. Then he has to use what they will call a vannul ghalib, the, the best probable evidence that is available for him and the assessment of that evidence. And based on that, he will make his decision. And sometimes we don't have an Islamic state and an Islamic court here today, but we may be dealing with situations, whether it be at work, whether it be at home, whether it be in our families, where it's a dispute that we are trying to resolve. There is no clear cut indication from the Quran or the Sunnah that uh, uh, allows you to make a decision in a particular way. So now you have to assess the situation. How do we do this? You will now use the best possible evidence that is there in front of you. So 
This is, these are the different types of zon where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is cautioning us. In another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about suspicion and dhan, he says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا That why this, this refers to the, the, the incident of ifk, the, the incident of the slander against Aisha radiallahu an, where many of the sahaba radiallahu anhum, they began to speak about this allegation against Aisha radiallahu anha. It's a very lengthy narration, very important narration, but very to summarize it that she was returning back with the army and it happened to be that she was delayed and she was left behind from the rest of the army and one sahabi Zat Safwan radiallahu an he was charged with being at the back of the army to check all of the lost goods of the army and he happened to come across her and with absolute dignity and honor he brought her back to Medina Munawwara. But the mischief makers and their mischief makers that were dead at that time and today you will also see mischief makers they saw this to be a very spicy and a very saucy story and well iyadu billah they uh, uh, spread this word that aisha radiallahu anha was having an affair with this particular sahabi so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he exonerates her he uses these words that why then when you O oh believers heard of it you heard this rumor going around did the believing men and women not think well of their own selves meaning that when you hear something about somebody who is outwardly good, the default position is you should think good of them. You should not be believing and having suspicion about that particular uh, uh, thing that is uh, said to us. So it's very important, especially today, and with the proliferation of social media, we, so, we see so many allegations, accusations that are being thrown around, flung around with regards to individuals. And you will find that pious people, people that are supposedly part of knowledge they are also part of this whole thing where very quickly we come to conclusions this person has said this this person has done that this person has said that how many times when we interact with people you will find that they will mention a certain incident about an individual and they've done absolutely no investigation with regards to that particular individual so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and sadly today as a community we have forgotten this ayah of the quran we have forgotten that stay away from most forms of suspicion because most forms of suspicion actually are sinful. In reality, nine times out of ten, what is being said about that individual is not true. You have the suspicion, you think evil about that person or you carry out an action and make a decision based on that and you were incorrect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we should stay away from one. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا The second thing, that you should not spy on one another. You should not spy on one another. In one tira'a, it is read as وَلَا تَحَسَّسُوا Both of them mean that you spy on one another. It comes in a hadith لَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا تَحَسَّسُوا Do not spy on one another and do not look for one another's faults. So we find that this is another serious sin that people engage in where they are trying to find out the faults of one another. They are trying to spy on people to try and identify and find, find those faults. One tafsir of this ayah is that you should not listen in on a conversation that is being done in confidence, where two people are having a conversation and you have not been invited into that conversation, but you go and you try and eavesdrop on that conversation so that you can find out what is being said. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions in a hadith that la taqtabu al-muslimin, that do not speak ill of the Muslims behind their backs and do not search out for their faults. For he who searches out their faults would have his faults searched out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he whose faults are searched out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be exposed by him even though he should be in the interior of his house. So what is this hadith saying to us? That if we go out and we try and find and investigate and pull out the faults of people. Yes, they may be carrying out that sin. But if we go out and try and pull out that sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it such that some of those sins that we are committing in the deep recesses of our own homes, nobody else knows about those sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make those sins become apparent. Again, you see with social media, 
how often you find that people are looking, you know, in fact, they, they troll social media to try and extract certain things that people say. That is why in public now you have to be so careful because things are taken out of context by individuals and then they are spread in such a manner that it seems as if this person was saying something incorrect. We have so many live examples in front of us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you should not spy on one another. And then the last one, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْدُكُمْ بَعْضًا That you should not backbite one another. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِحْتُمُ That does one of you like that he eats the flesh of his dead brother, you would abhor it. You would definitely hate it. So here, this is the one of the greatest forms of sins where a person is saying something evil about another person behind his back. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the Sahaba radiallahu an, atadruna mal ghiba? That do you know what is ghiba? And he mentioned that dhikruka akhaka bima yakrah. Where you mention something about your fellow brother which he dislikes. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked, what happens if that thing that you are mentioning is actually true? He's guilty of that fault. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then that is actually ghibat, that is actually backbiting. Because if it is something that is not true and you are mentioning it about him, that is a greater sin that is buhtan. Buhtanun azim, a great slander. Slander means you accuse somebody of something which they are not guilty of. Ghiba or backbiting is where you speak ill of a person. They may be guilty of that. They may have committed that error or that fault. But you are speaking out of turn or you are speaking evil about them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Ayuhibbu ahadukum. Does one of you like that he should eat the flesh of his dead brother? Definitely you would not want to do this. So this is a very serious sin. Many times people also say that I have no problem saying this evil about this person or speaking bad about this person or pointing out this fault. I will tell it to him on his face. I will tell him on his face so it's not actually ghiba. This is also a sin which we, which we discussed earlier. This is lams. This is insulting the person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ You should not insult one another. وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةِ اللُّمَزَةِ Wail, woe to every backbiter and every derider, everyone who insults. So whether you say it to his face or whether you say it behind his back, the principle is here that Sharia does not want us to insult anybody. Sharia does not want us to cause any inconvenience or hurt the feelings of anybody else. So when it comes to backbiting, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu narrates the hadith, that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went up to Mi'raj and he passed by people who had fingernails of copper and they were scratching their faces and their chests violently. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Jibreel alayhi wa sallam that who are these people? So Jibreel alayhi wa sallam said they are those people who were given to backbiting their brothers and who attacked their honor. The punishment was that they had fingernails of copper and they were scratching their faces and they were scratching their chests. Their, their chests. Rasulullah sallallahu says, Al-ghibatu ashaddu min zina Ghiba is worse than zina. And we all know what a great sin zina is. What, what safeguards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in the sharia with regards to prevention of zina. And why? Because when zina becomes widespread, there are so many other social evils that you will find that take place. The entire system in the home is broken down. Then you will find that children will grow up in a dysfunctional manner. And go and look at Western society and you will see that it's a broken society. You will see that children are doing unnatural things. Just look at the example you find. A 14-year-old child picks up a rifle and shoots up an entire school. 14 years old. This is a young little child. That child, he should be playing soccer, cricket, football outside. But these, this is what is going through. And then when you investigate, you will find that this child comes from a broken home. And what leads to the broken home? One of the things, this promiscuity, this zina. So we're finding here that Rasulullah is saying that backbiting is worse than zina. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked, how so, O Rasul of Allah? Rasulullah sallallahu mentioned that a person, he'll commit zina, <clears throat> he'll acknowledge the sin, he will make tawbah, and his sin is forgiven. 
because he knows this is something that is incorrect. But the sin of big backbiting, firstly, is not forgiven unless the injured party forgives him. So, in zina, it is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are breaking. But when it comes to riba, you are breaking the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also the right of a fellow human being. And ulama explain what is even worse, most people don't even realize or recognize that they're committing a sin. Because ghibat has become so common. We just ask ourselves the question, in the last month, in the last week, in the last 24 hours, in the last 5 years, how many times have we actually consciously recognized and realized that I'm speaking ill of this person. I'm committing an act of ghibah, of backbiting, and I'm actually stopping myself, or I'm stopping my family member. Very rarely is that the case. Yet if a person had committed zina, may Allah Ta'ala protect each and every one of us, this will play on your mind. You will recognize that the sin is there. So many people don't even realize that they are committing the sin, and therefore they don't actually make tawbah from this particular sin. Of course, the ulama have mentioned that if the person that you have made ghibat of is not aware that you have made ghibat of him, then it is not necessary to go and ask him and mention him and inform him that, you know what, on so and so day, I spoke bad about you. Now he's going to get insulted. He might get upset with you. So in that case, you make toba and you don't inform the person that you made the riba of him. When it comes to backbiting, there are certain situations where it is permissible to speak ill. For example, if you are complaining against a tyrant before a person who can assist in that situation. Somebody is oppressing you and there's somebody else that has the authority to intervene in the situation, then it would be permissible. If you are complaining about the wife or children to the father or the husband, so the husband and the father can rectify the situation, then it is permissible. If you have to give information in order to obtain a fatwa, if you have to warn the Muslims of the mischief of a mischief maker, so if there genuinely is a mischief maker, now this is where we have to use the litmus test that if some information is spread about a so-and-so person, this person has done certain thing. We have to look into our hearts and ask ourselves, am I genuinely forwarding this message onto the group to protect the fellow brothers and sisters on the group? Or am I sending it out because I am just wanting to insult this individual? This is the test that each and every one, and nine times out of ten, in reality, when we forward those messages, we're not forwarding it with the intention of protecting people. We're actually forwarding it with the intention of spreading the mischief. So we have to assess and look at this situation. If somebody consults a person in a manner, then it is obligatory to mention any weaknesses because this person is now seeking your mashwara and he's asking you for advice. If a person commits sin openly and publishes his behavior himself, then it is not prohibited to make mention of his bad deeds. To make mention of his bad deeds. It's not permissible to insult him. It's not permissible to call him a kafir and a zindik and a fasik and a this and the list and list goes on. That's not permissible. It's permissible to make mention of his bad deeds. However, however, Mawlana Ashraf Ali Tanvi, Rahimahullah, whom many of us and many of our ulama look up to, he writes in the commentary of this verse in Bayan al-Qur'an, he mentions that it is abominable and reprehensible to indulge in even making mention of the bad deeds on account of the wastage of time. So even making mention, we have to question ourselves because even making mention of these bad deeds, that a person is committing openly, publicly, even making mention of those bad deeds, is, comes in the tafsir, that that is also reprehensible because it is a waste of time. And we have to assess the situation. We are all lay people. When we are mentioning the fault of somebody else, even if that person has committed that fault openly, what benefit are we getting out of the entire situation? What guidance are we providing? You know, very often nowadays, especially on social media, this uh, comment comes out that no, we need to protect the people. We need to protect the people from so and so's harm. Let those who are charged with protecting people from the harm, whether it is the senior ulama, whether it is the authorities, let them issue the statement in the way that they're supposed to issue the statement and let them protect it. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not kept you and I as chiefs of the entire community to protect everybody from the harm, especially on public groups. It's a different story in your own family situation, in your own nuclear home situation. If you have to mention to your children that look, this by way of teaching them, because you are bringing them up, you are teaching them, you have to mention something. But is it necessary on the public community chat group to mention the evil of somebody? Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed you, Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C, like all of us laymen, unqualified, has he appointed us as the guides, the spiritual guides of the community? No, we are members of the community. We don't have the responsibility on our shoulders to do that. Let those who are in authority, those who have the ability to do it, let them go ahead and do what they need to do. Because if we don't, you will find that we are falling into this very great sin of ghibah. And we, just by liking, just by putting a thumbs up, just by forwarding, you know, sometimes you say, you know what, I'm not making khibat, I'm just forwarding the message. I'm just forwarding the message. You are becoming part of the chain of that message being forwarded and you are becoming part of the chain of riba. And everybody that now gets that message because you have forwarded it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can track. Maybe WhatsApp is not able to show you that it came from A, B, C, D, just as forwarded many times. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly that it went from A to B to C to D and how it was forwarded across. So we should be extremely, extremely cautious with regards to this. So there were six sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions with regards to our interpersonal relations. Number one, we should not mock at one another. Number two, we should not insult one another. Number three, we should not call one another uh, disgraceful names. Number four, we should not un have unwarranted suspicion for one another. Number five, we should not spy on one another. Number six, and one of the greatest sins, we should not backbite one another. That is why we find that this surah is known as Surah Al-Akhlaq. Because if we have to study this surah alone, and we have to implement what is g uh, given to us in this surah alone, Without a shadow of doubt, the majority of our problems in society when it comes to interpersonal relations will be solved. They will be solved. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings a beautiful, beautiful verse. Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind. Now we are not just talking about the believers. We are now talking to everybody. From the time of Adam alayhi salam right till the last person. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakari wa untha. We have created you from a male and a female. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us this? He's taking us back to our origin. And he is negating all forms of pride based on race, based on skin color, based on anything to do ethnicity, geographical location. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negating all forms of superiority. What, what have we done? وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلٍ we have made you into races and tribes. Why? Why have we done that? Lita'arafu. So that you may identify one another. And then, how do we determine who is better than the next person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear here. Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. Verily, the noblest amongst you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones who have the greatest amount of taqwa. The litmus test for who is better than one person versus another person is not his skin color, is not his ethnicity, it's not where he comes from, it's not whether he is from the first world or the global south, it's not whether he is black or white, it is the person that has the most taqwa. Inna Allah alimun khabir. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and he is all aware. Very interesting the reason for the revelation of this verse when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conquered Makkah the occasion of Fath Makkah it was the time of Adhan and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Sayyiduna Bilal radiallahu an to call out the Adhan so one of the mushrikeen from the Quraysh they cynically remarked thank God that my father died before this happened and he did not have to see this bad day another person mentioned could Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not find anyone better than this black crow to sound the adhan in the haram, in the sacred mosque? Abu Sufyan, 
he said, I do not wish to utter anything for fear that the master of the heavens will inform him. And immediately Jibreel alayhi salam comes down and he informs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam about this conversation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi calls these individuals. He asks them about it. They admit it and they confess. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals this verse. That here on the occasion of the conquest of Makkah, the pinnacle in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when the adhan is to be called out, who is used, who is the tool? Rasulullah sallallahu chooses a black freed slave from Abyssinia to call out the adhan because the litmus test is that the most noblest amongst you is the one that is the most pious. So this is the taqwa that we should have in our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the ability to understand. May He bless us with the ability to bring this into our lives. This particular verse, it cuts through all national linguistic divisions which are the creation of modern man, the, the borders that have been created, the nationalism that has been created and particularly in the Muslim world, nationalism has actually broken and torn the entire ummah into pieces. That today we have 1.7 billion Muslims, one of the largest religions in the world. But because of nationalism, because of tribalism and because of so many other isms, our ummah is completely fragmented such that when we need to stand up together on a common cause, we're unable to do so. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the correct understanding. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ